If you have your Bibles, open to Psalm chapter number 1, the book of the Psalms and the first chapter there in Psalms chapter number 1. As we look at, continue to look at Psalms chapter 1, began last week, and boy, what a difference a week makes in Michigan. Last week, there was no power. There are trees everywhere. There was a, a veritable mess. And this week, boy, you almost forget of the storm of the century as the news portrays all those storms. And uh, boy, you know what? Michigan's not a bad place to live. Gets a bad rap. Some of you snowbirds give it a bad rap going down south. It's too cold up here, but we don't. Yeah, I see that, Brother Woodbury. We don't get hurricanes up here in Michigan. All right? We don't get too many tornadoes a little bit here. And uh, we just have a little bit of snow. You say, it's a lot of snow, Pastor Howell. No, go to Alaska. That's a lot of snow. We get a little. It's all about perspective. All about perspective. But man, what a, what a beautiful week. Lord was good to us. Um, I have this, this thing that I like to do, and many men can identify. I like to use a chainsaw. Any men identify with that? I enjoy chainsaws. I remember when I bought my first chainsaw, someone wisely and very, uh, with much, I mean, compassion in my life told me, J.D., most likely um, once you buy one chainsaw, you'll buy another one because most people don't have just one chainsaw. And ladies, I'm sorry, but that's a true statement. <laughs> my wife's back there, and I, I have a couple of chainsaws now. At one time, I owned three chainsaws. You, what do you need with three chainsaws, Brother Howell? <laughs> what kind of question is that? Why do you have a car? All right? Why do you have a house? Why do you have why do you have indoor plumbing? It's the same thing. <laughs> I know some of you ladies aren't going to like uh, no, but a chainsaw. And this past week with those trees getting chopped down, I got to use a chainsaw. And that was just wonderful. There's not much more manly thing in life than to, to grab something that can really kill you, <laughs> put a large motor on it, and swing it around your legs. This can't be unsafe. This is a wonderful thing. And, uh, but no, no, uh, we had the chainsaw. Why? Because the trees fell down, right? Trees fell down. This morning we're going to look at some tree, a tree that the Bible talks about in Psalm chapter 1. See, that wasn't all just because I want to talk about chainsaws. Some of you are like, where is he going with this? I'm going somewhere with this. There were some big trees that fell down. My parents had a, had a huge pine tree. It looked like about, about half of it snapped at, right, and about maybe 60 feet down and 60 feet still on the ground. Some big trees were knocked over this past weekend, weekend before last, with, with some wind. Now, the fact is that that trees are very helpful. There are over three trillion trees in the world. Over three trillion. And some of you think they all grow in your backyard. Over three trillion trees in the world. They can use over 100 gallons of water a day. And the tallest trees, of course, in California, the sequoias. And the very tallest tree that I could find was one that is 379.7 feet tall. To give you perspective, the center peak of this auditorium, I believe, is 34 feet tall. So over 10 times as tall as the ceiling on top is, is this tree. The location of this tree is known to only a few people. I, I, this is what they said. I, I don't know to trust or not, but they said because of vandalism, they will not say where this tree, um, uh, Hyperon perhaps is the name of it, in the Sequoia National Forest. And there are some trees that grow fastly, some trees that grow slow. The slowest growing tree is a white cedar. It's located in Canada. And after 155 years, it grew to a height of, after 155 years, a height of four inches and weighed about a third of a pound, a little over a third of a pound. It's found on a cliff in the Great Lakes area in Canada. And yet in Psalm chapter 1, if we look there with me, please, this morning in Psalm chapter 1, the psalmist gives us the, the, the description of a blessed man a happy man, the description of someone who has some strength, and he'll compare in verse number two, or verse number three, I'm sorry, to a tree. Let, if we would please look at me in Psalm chapter one. The Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he, and here it is, and he shall be like uh, what's the next word? A tree. He shall be like a what? A tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Then godly are not sober like the chaff which the wind driveth away. 
Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this psalm and the truth that it brings to us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to understand what you're trying to teach us from this passage. Lord, help me to have the words to say and the, and the timing to say it. Lord, may I say only those things that would please and be true to your word and please you. But Lord, help us as listeners to listen with an open and responsive heart. Would your spirit work? Lord, would you meet with us, please, and touch us and change us? In Jesus' name I ask, amen. The Bible says that we're to be like a tree. The Bible says the very first word of this psalm is blessed. So the Bible would like us, what wants to teach us, how to have a prosperous, fruitful, successful, happy life. There are some churches, some preachers out there that will preach what they call a prosperity gospel. The, the, the gospel that says something like this, nothing will ever go wrong in your life, and we know that not to be true. They'll say like this, if, if you give a little money to the church, God will take that money, that seed money they'll call it, and, and he'll give it back to you a hundredfold or, or, or thousandfold. And listen, I wish that were true. I wish that were true. The Bible gives us, though, some very specific promises. The Bible never promises that we'll never have any trouble. The Bible never promises that we won't have bills in our life, but the Bible does promise and does teach us that we can have a blessed and happy and a joyful life. That's what the psalm is talking about. And the psalmist here begins with a blessing. The blessed is the man, the description, or what it looks like to be blessed. I love the fact that he compares it to a tree. We'll get there in the sermon today. Because thinking about those trees this last weekend, I saw some large trees snap. But you, you see at times these, these huge trees that can handle a storm. And often in life, we'll have a storm of life. And you see sometimes a person, a Christian, who handles and weathers the storms of life in a way that you find mind-blowing. How could they walk through that trouble? How could they walk through that turmoil and still have the stability? And I believe the psalmist teaches us it's because you're, they're like a tree. The description, what it looks like to be blessed. I remember once I had a friend, and this friend was in seminary. Seminary is a place that after you go to college, they learn to teach you about the Bible. He was preparing to be a pastor, and he had some, some incredible struggle in his life. He came to me because he was struggling, and, and he said, J.D., I just don't even know if God exists anymore. See, sometimes the storms of life are so severe and so strong that if we're not like a tree, those thoughts will come and, and try to tear our roots out of the ground. It was a few years back that when I lived in another place on Airport Road that we had not a tornado but some tornado-esque winds come through. And when I drove down King Road toward my house, I saw these trees and some larger trees, not the largest trees, but some of the smaller trees were completely uprooted. You see, I believe the Bible does not want us to be uprooted. The Bible wants us to stand strong and stand like Psalm chapter 1 verse 3 says, like a tree. I want you to be a tree in life, a tree that can withstand the turmoil of life, a tree that can be firmly planted and grounded in the truth. And so I want to give you the description of a blessed man today. And the first thing I see is this. The first thing I see is the place of his delight. Look at me in verse 2, if you would, please. The Bible says this, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Where is his delight? Help me here. Where is his delight? In the law of the Lord. Where is it? The law of the Lord. It says that the Bible says this, that his pleasure, that's what that word delight means. He ought to enjoy it. He ought to savor it. He ought to deem it to be valuable. Now, there are lots of things that we enjoy in life, and, and I'll tell you, quite frankly, one of the things that I enjoy most is food. It's hard to say no to good food. One of the things I most enjoy in life is ribeye steaks. Now, some of you might be filet, filet mignon steak people, and that's okay. I pray the Lord touches your heart like he's touched my heart. And he shows you from his word that a ribeye is really the best cut of meat that I think a man can get, or lady, or person. I love ribeye steak, and I had the opportunity a while back to go to a restaurant that served what's called a cowboy ribeye. There's ribeye steaks, and then you can have a cowboy ribeye. A cowboy ribeye has the bone still in it, and it's a whole chunk of meat. It's practically half a cow on your plate. 
And they ask, how do you want that cooked? And I always get my steak cooked medium rare. That's how I do mine. I don't know if it's called cooking or, or heating uh, at, that, at that temperature. And boy, they brought that steak out, and that was amazing. But you know what? After I eat it again, I can eat another one. I begin to desire that steak. But there's other things I like too, like apple pie. Anybody like apple pie in here with ice cream? I could eat that right now. Our dog, we have a small, my wife has a small dog. I don't know if it's a dog or a rat, about three and a half pounds. His name is Max. Who knew we were at the, the pet hospital the other day, a, a yearly checkup, and I think Max is the number one or number two most popular dog name in the U.S. right now. So I'm, somehow I, they named him correctly. I didn't name him, the kids did. I want to name him Cat or Skunk, but... You know, I thought, how, how neat would that be, call, call the dog cat when he, anyway. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Max desires something in my house that, that usually only I give him, and that is shortbread cookies. I don't know how this became a thing, but, but my dog will not eat regular dog food typically, unless my wife feeds him, okay? And he won't, like if you have a, a piece of steak, he won't eat the steak, he doesn't like steak, and pork or chicken, he won't touch that, and normal things that I think that carn carnivore animals ought to eat, he doesn't eat. But shortbread cookies, this dog loves. And he's got good taste because he only eats two brands. <laughs> Lorna Dune. And uh, the other, there's a white, I forget the name of it now, there's a white packet, it comes in a package, um, uh, Pepperidge Farm, yes, Pepperidge Farm, shortbread cookies. And I think what happened, if I remember correctly, one night I was eating one and he jumped up on my lap and grabbed it out of my mouth. What he didn't realize is that's a good way to die at my house. It's a good way. You don't live too long grabbing food out of dad's mouth. But since that point, he, uh, he and I have a special bond. The bond is he barks, and then I give him a shortbread cookie. That's the bond. He's trained me well. And he'll come, and he knows where they sit. They sit right above the microwave. When I walk in the house, the other kids don't give him the, a cookie, and Doreen doesn't really give him a cookie. So when I come home, and he comes, he comes right to me, and he knows after I walk in the door, he's getting a shortbread cookie. He runs over there, and, and if he barks, I won't give it to him, but he'll bark, and then he'll stand there and just look. And he's only this tall. So it's like a mountain. He looks up there, and he looks, and... And every once in a while I'll reach because my coffee's right above that. I reach for the coffee and he, he jumps a little bit and I pull out a coffee mug and he's, and he's not happy. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll pull that shortbread cookie out and break off a little piece. I guess it's terrible for dogs, but there's no chocolate in it, so, you know, be that as it may. And I'll hold it out and he'll jump up and grab it and run away. And heaven forbid you get between Max and a shortbread cookie. And the Bible says here that the man who's going to be planted, the man who's going to be like a tree, the man who's going to be blessed is going to find his delight not in shortbread cookies, not in cowboy ribeyes, not in apple pie with ice cream, though that's delicious, but in the law of the Lord. And I think we can learn a lot from my dog, Max. When was the last time you came to God's Word and you're hungry for it? When was the last time you found the delight, not just the duty, but the delight in the Word of God, where you said, God, I need the fresh bread from heaven. God, I need you to speak to me. God, I want to find my delight right here, not in my phone, not in my Facebook, not on my TV or talk radio, but I want to find it right here in God's Word. His delight is found in God's law. To be like that tree, you see, his satisfaction is found in God's Word. 2019, there are many people who are delighting in other things other than God's Word. They're delighting in their phone. They're delighting. It's a thing now to, to be addicted to a phone, addicted to social media, addicted to talk radio, addicted to sports, addicted to many things that are not God's Word. And then they wonder when the storm of life's come, why they're so easily uprooted, why they're turned upside down. Why? Because your roots were shallow, because you're supposed to be delighting right here. You see, what I want is found in God's Word. His delight is in the law of God. What amazes me is the, the, the fact is when this psalm would have been written, the law of God would have been basically those, those first five books or so. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Somewhere in there, there might have been a couple, a couple of things written as well, but, but what they're saying is his delight is found in reading Leviticus. 
Now, if you've read your Bible at all, you come to Leviticus, you're like, man, that's some tough reading. But, but yet, what the point is, is that I want to be close to God. I want to be close to the things of God. I want to I have the thoughts of God. I want my delight to be found in God himself. His satisfaction is found in God's Word. But then I see that his sustenance is found in God's Word. And in his law doth he meditate. Now, often... People will talk about this particular concept like a cow. Now, you may not know this or not, but more people die from cows than from sharks every year. Cows are dangerous creatures, apparently. Be careful of cows. But cows do something. They'll chew the cud. They'll chew it, and and they say that a cow will spend nearly eight hours out of every day chewing the cud. Thus, they say, the normal chewing of food for a cow can be upwards of 40,000 jaw movements a day while it chews its food. When the Bible says, and in his law doth he meditate, it has the idea that that I sit on it, that I think about it, that I come back to it, that I don't just look at God's Word and I walk away, but I come back to it again, and I come back to it again, I come back to it again, and maybe there's a thought, maybe there's a verse that grips my heart. There's that great verse in the Psalms, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Boy, a great verse if you struggle getting irritated. And you may need that verse all day, every day. You may need to say it while you drive. Great peace have they, love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. As I run them off, you know, great peace have they, and at the grocery store, and maybe sometimes at home. But you meditate on that verse. You see, he finds his sustenance in the Word of God. Our minds are often filled with wasteful thoughts. They're filled with weird thoughts sometimes with wicked thoughts, but they're not usually filled with worshipful thoughts. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. I remember when I was a child coming into Christmas, it just occupies your mind. I loved Christmas. I still love Christmas. And Christmas Eve is probably the hardest night of the year to go to sleep, even at 39. I love Christmas. Why? Because your mind is occupied in something else. The fact is we know this as adults, though sometimes our mind is occupied with problems. And it seems like at night as you lay down and you close your eyes, those problems come flood, flooding back. The psalmist is teaching us, listen, if you're going to be planted like a tree by the rivers of water, you've got to keep your mind on Jesus Christ, on his word. In his, in his word, he meditates day and night. He thinks on it and says, God, that's what I want in my mind. I want your word to fill my mind. I want your principles. I want your commandments. I want your love from your scriptures to fill my mind, to have a blessed life. You've got to delight in God's word, but you have to meditate on God's word. Not only do I see the place of his delight, but I see the picture of his depth. In verse 3, he shall be like a tree. Interesting that the Bible didn't say he should be like a weed, like a dandelion. It didn't say he should be like a, like a small bush or a shrub, because we would have different ideas associated with those different plants. Yet he says he'll be like a tree. I think it shows strength. Trees are strong. Trees bring shade. And in this, in this current age and culture, we need men and women who have the strength found only in God's Word. We need some dads who will be strong like a tree in the home and some moms who will be strong like a tree. We need some grandparents. We need some friends. You need to have some friends who will be the right kind of friend who are strong like a tree planted by the rivers of water, some strength. But I see health. I see health. I'm not talking about a physical health, but a mental health, a spiritual health. He says he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Pictures of a tree that's just prosperous, a tree that has lots of green leaves in the midst of maybe some, some desert. And then I see abundance, he shall bring forth his fruit in his season. At our last house, we were able to have some apple trees. At first, we had just two apple trees. Now, listen, I am not a, what's that, a horticulturist? What, what, what works with trees outside? Something like that. I am not that person. I can cut trees with a chainsaw, but I can't prune trees real well. I had these apple trees, and the first year they were there, we did not receive any apples off the apple tree. 
So I asked some people here at church who knew about apple trees. They said, well, you have to prune them and, and you have to fertilize them. And so, boy, this, this, this winter came and I said, well, I can prune, I can prune trees. I got a chainsaw. I can prune things. And uh, boy, we pruned that apple tree back and uh, both of them actually. And, uh, and they came on fertilizer. And the next year, we had apples. But they were tiny apples. And I did not think, wow, what a great apple tree. I got small apples. I'm thinking, I want big apples. I want the ones you see at Kroger. Those are the apples I want, the big old ones. So we pruned some more. The next year, we got some bigger apples. And, and then we moved. All right, so I got no more apples. <laughs> the picture we have here, though, is someone who is a tree, like a tree, whose fruit is just luscious and large, huge. In verse, I was in Puerto Rico. My grandparents live in Puerto Rico. My grandfather's house, he used to live outside of San Juan. He had some fruit trees. He had a mango tree, and those mangoes were huge. They were lush. The tree was prosperous. The person who delights in God's Word gains the strength to endure the storms that come. God wants you to have the strength to be like a tree, to be prosperous, read abundance. See, you delight in God's Word, we see his death, but then I see, or the depth of the tree. But lastly, I see this, a little phrase in verse 3. The Bible says this, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. When I was studying this passage, I came across that last phrase, and I've memorized this psalm years ago. I've quoted it many times. I've read it in my personal devotions countless times. But that phrase, when I was studying this passage, caught me again, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You see, there's a blessing associated here. There's a promise here that if someone... If someone plants himself like a tree because of their love and delight in God's Word and meditates on it, that the psalmist says that this particular individual, this man who's blessed, now will prosper. And the Bible says, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. It's, it's a large blessing. And I see, lastly, the prospering of his deeds. You see, why does, why does the Bible bring this concept? I think it's attached to the phrase before, his leaf also shall not wither. There is protection for endurance. We live in Michigan. We understand when leaves change colors, and it's beautiful in reds and oranges and terrible when they turn brown because then they fall. And we have to deal with them. This idea is a tree that never loses leaves. It shall not wither. It never gets in the heat and, and begins to wither and fade. This tree is huge. It can weather a storm. And delighting God's word brings a freshness every day. But not only is there protection for endurance, it's prosperous in endeavors. I could not help but think of the book of James. I love the book of James. I preached through it last year. And in James chapter 1, there's a verse that says this, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, yet this verse promises that whatsoever he doeth, this man shall prosper. I see a comparison here with someone who follows Psalm chapter 1 as they delight in God's Word. They have a singular focus. They want to please the Lord. They have a singular desire. They want to be with God and be in God's Word. And as they spend time with God, they reap the blessing from God, and their singular focus brings blessing in their life. But then I see the comparison in James, a double-minded man is unstable. I'm afraid that many of us are double-minded in our ways. Oh, we come to church on Sunday, but on Monday, the Bible gets set on the shelf. We pray and worship God on Sunday at church, but on Tuesday, we're at work and not a second thought for God and, his, and the things of God. Maybe we come back Tuesday night during the summer and Wednesday during the, during the other rest of the year and we meet with God again Wednesday night. But on Thursday, hey, God's not in my thoughts. They begin to become unstable and you'll see people who will jump from job to job to job. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. They'll have relationship trouble with a husband and wife or friends because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. They have a problem with their kids and problem with whatever they do because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And yet this psalm says that a singular-minded man, one who delights in God's Word, one who meditates there in day and night, whatever he does, God says that'll prosper. 
You see, what will happen is the perspective will change. You say, well, does prosper mean that I'll get a brand new car? I hope you do, but not necessarily. Does it mean I'll get that 20,000 square foot house I've been looking at? I hope you do and invite me over. Doesn't mean that, but it means that whatever you do will prosper. I think of Joseph, and I'll close with this. I think of Joseph. The Bible talks about how Joseph followed and stayed with God. He was put through some circumstances in the Bible that were less than ideal. He was sent to prison. He was sold into slavery. But all the while, he honored the Lord, followed his principles. And the Bible teaches us that God helped Joseph to prosper. Even in prison, Joseph prospered. At the end of the story, Joseph now is a, not only prosperous in his endeavors, but prosperous in a financial way, prosperous with his family, prosperous before the Lord. And he can look back on his life and say, God did this. And he said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You see, Psalm chapter 1 teaches us that we can be like a tree. The storms of life will come, but you don't have to be uprooted. You don't have to be turned on end. You can have a prosperous, delighting life when you lighten God's Word and stay close to Him. Lord, I thank You for Your Word, for the truth this morning. Lord, I ask You to help us. Lord, to understand that if we're not delighting in Your Word, we can't succeed. But if we're not meditating therein, day and night. We have no chance to be like a tree for strength, prosperity. What it would say, Pastor Howell, as you spoke this morning, God spoke to me in an area in my life that I realized that there's other delight besides God and His Word. That I think about God on Sunday, but I don't meditate therein, like the Scripture says. Would you pray for me? God spoke to me this morning. Would you pray for me? We go, amen, amen. I want to be like that tree and have the blessing that God says He can bring. I wonder if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. Oh, God loves you, and Jesus died for you. We'd love to help you know that. You say, you know, Brother Howell, as you're speaking, I, I don't know that I've ever trusted Christ as my Savior, and I'd like to. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I'll draw no more attention to you than I did to them. But I wonder if you're here and you don't know that you're on your way to heaven. You say, would you pray for me? Amen. I see the hand of other others. Lord, you've seen these hands and you know our needs. I pray that we follow you, Lord. We delight in you so we can be like that tree. In Jesus' name, amen.